This is Viticulture, where we share conversations with makers, growers, thinkers, and doers, folks who cultivate a good life. My name is Chris Missick, and I'm a lawyer turned winemaker in the Finger Lakes region of New York State, and I'm sitting down with great people in wine and other walks of life to hear their stories, learn their lessons, and take their advice on the perfect pairing. Today we're speaking with Oyan Mukherjee, an incredible musical talent with an ear and voice for harmonies, and a virtuoso with violin and other string instruments. He's a member of the band Darling Side, an indie quartet out of Boston that captivated me and the rest of my cellar crew with their album Extra Life. His thoughtful mind and textural music provide a bit of a soundtrack of sorts for some of the most important moments in my life. If you like this podcast, please be sure to rate us five stars in Apple Podcasts and like our videos on YouTube. It really helps with the ratings and in introducing new folks to the show. Don't forget to visit our website at viticulturepodcast.com. Subscribe to our Substack, where you'll get show notes, transcripts, musings, and exclusive offers. And check us out on all the major social media platforms. And now, here's the show. Welcome to Viticulture, and when we are making wine in the cellar, there's always some sort of soundtrack playing. It guides us through the seasons, it inspires our decisions, and it really is one of our best friends. It also helps us set uh, the rhythm of our lives, and we remember where we were when that song comes on. Music's important. It's important to us as people, and it's important to our winemaking, and that's why I am honored to have on the show today, Oyan Mukherjee from Darling Side. Darling Side is an amazing group that blends harmony, instrumentation, and a lot of literature into their music. I'm hoping this is a chance for those of you who haven't heard Darling Side to explore them as we explore a, a conversation with a really fascinating individual. So thanks so much for joining us, Oyan. I Thanks really so much for appreciate the it. lovely introduction, Chris. Appreciate it. And yeah, very happy to be here. So I'm going to set the stage uh, just so you kind of know. During harvest, we work really long hours. It, it is not uncommon that there are days we are on the crush pad until midnight or two and in the vineyards as early as 4.30. Oh, wow. That's and brutal. As, <laughs> they're oh. long days. Yeah. Uh, that happens. It's not the entire crush process, but it happens. And I really meant what I said, you know, aside from some coffee, uh, it is music that keeps us going. And every seller sort of has their own sound, their own small seller music culture. And in our seller, Darling Side was an important part of that, particularly when the album Extra Life came out. Uh, so to have the chance to sit in here and talk to you, to explore some of your background and the music uh, is to me the perfect complement to the notion of viticulture, where we put an emphasis on culture and the things that lead us to live a good life. That is so cool to hear. We, uh, it's, it's such a funny thing to, it, I, I still, I try to keep as much of the early days of the band in my mind as, as possible to sort of, uh, to put into context how wonderful a lot of the experiences that we're getting to have now that we're a decade in um, are. And uh, to think that some songs that a few friends and I got to write in like basements and houses, uh, just that we were just making stuff up on our own with, with, you know, a lot of influences from various places to know that, uh, to, uh one of the, one of my favorite things is learning that, that, um, that what we produced ended up, uh, influencing people, art, of uh, like feelings and just like just the, the, the fact that, that what we do might inspire someone else in a very small measure, the way that our favorite art has inspired us is such a cool thing to hear. And so it's, yeah, it's very fun to, to hear that. Thank you for letting us know. Of course. You know, in some ways it sort of speaks to how we look at our respective arts or crafts. Um, as, you know, as a winemaker, I, I don't always consider it to be an art of the caliber you guys produce. It really is a craft that we get to put artistic embellishments on. But one of the coolest things about the craft of winemaking 
is that we aren't just making something that someone looks at, like it, it is imbibed and it becomes a part of them. But in a lot of ways, music is like that. Music is a form of art that once you hear it, uh, especially if it's something that resonates with you, it will stay in your head. I, I can hear songs like Eschaton or your recent uh, rendition of The Parting Glass uh, just playing with me throughout my own life. So it is a cool part of the way music and wine can fit together to become part of the, the person who, you know, they may have consumed it, but it becomes part of them too. That's, that's a very cool way of thinking about things. And yeah, I, I am, I think probably uh, further over on the art side, when I think about things that are imbibed, consumed, wine, food, et cetera, uh, when I think about people, like I think, um, you know, the, the craft versus art thing is, is, exists in all um, in, in all art forms where, where it was sort of, it, it, the, 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 it's always a combination of those two things in terms of what's being produced and, uh, and a, a lot of how um, it's interpreted is sort of like whether, oh, well, that's, that's just a craft or that's really art, that kind of thing. And there's a, there's a very fuzzy line that, that m- most people don't agree on, I think. Um, but with, with food, I think, yeah, the uh, food and wine and, and it, uh, comestibles, um, the fact that it is not just something that becomes part of the person, which is a very cool way of thinking about it, but also it is something that is just by nature ephemeral. It's going to, it's like, it's, it's an ice sculpture. It's going to be, by the time you're done consuming it, it's gone. You can't have it again. And that, there's something that's very, um, that's just really beautiful about that, I think, that, that uh, makes, in some ways, more special than some of the things that are repeatable experiences. That's a very cool thing. I think. It is true. The, the ephemeral nature of it. Um, you know, speaking about, ephemeral nature, things that have gone away. Uh, our past is one of those things, but it stays with us and it, it does shape who we are. I'd love to hear some of what it was like for you to grow up. You grew up in Kansas City, mm-hmm. um, had some interesting experiences in school, uh, challenges too. These shape us. Uh, can you share that? Yeah, sure. Um, so let's see. I uh, grew up in, as you mentioned, in Kansas City. I was born in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and then my family moved to Kansas City when I was two. And um, I, I was like, very fortunate to have uh, parents who uh, were extremely supportive in a whole range of different ways. Um, uh, the, and the way I ended up getting into music was um, my older brother, Arno, has a moderate learning disability. And uh, his, my mom was told by some family friend that getting him started on music lessons would be a great way for, to, to sort of uh, develop his mind in, in um, ways that are sort of parallel, um, but distinct from the academic path that he was, um, was on. Uh, and then when my younger brother and I ro- came around uh, a few years later, uh, we were also just sort of gently nudged into music, uh, independent of, of uh, any diagnoses, but uh, it was for the best, I think. Um, so that's how I got into uh, playing violin. And, or I, 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 I in describing that, I said how I got into it, but how I was ushered into playing violin, uh, which was a thing that I wasn't terribly interested in for um, most of my life. It was just a thing that I was told I should be doing uh, in order to get into a good school. That is, I think, a, a not infrequent um, South Asian parent strategy of just, you just have the child do the things. So I was doing the things um, and uh, yeah, didn't learn to uh, really enjoy playing music until significantly later in life. But um, yeah, like, please let me know what, uh, what part of that uh, you'd like for me to expand upon because I could sort of go on for hours with this kind of stuff. So I'm fascinated. You started with violin at three years old, uh-huh. right? Yeah. And uh, I- I've heard you relay in other interviews just how painful it, might, it is for parents to hear three-year-olds practice violin it's of a miserable, all instruments. Yeah, I mean, it might be... It, it, so the, the, the violin... Um, for those of you who are out there in podcast world who don't uh, aren't familiar with the um, difference between guitars, violins, et cetera, in terms of how they're played, uh, with, on a guitar, uh, a guitar can be thought of like a piano where you have frets, which are the small metal bars that separate um, if you look closely at a guitar neck. And those prevent you from playing um, anything other than half steps between, assuming you have a tuned guitar. It's like, like a piano. You can't play a note that's between the two keys on a piano um, or between a, a white and a black key. On a violin or a human voice, uh, if you think about that, there is nothing stopping you from playing notes that are just slightly off. Um, and so that makes it, it can make it a much more expressive instrument because you can do things like vibrato, you can slide, you can do, when, when, in the hands of a master, it is something that is beautiful. And in the hands of a child, uh, it is 
terrible. And, and in addition to that, uh, the, the, the sort of tuning insult is that um, children's violins are smaller and by dint of their size, they're also higher pitched. So they are these tiny squeaky, or they're maybe not higher pitched, but they're these squeaky, small, sad instruments that just, it's just, it's not a, even, even a, a, someone who plays a violin well playing one of those tiny instruments is not going to do, uh, is not going to sound great, but a child playing it, it's really, it's really rough stuff. You know, um, my son is four years old now, and uh, there are two things that tie in here. So we have a piano at home, and my wife has painstakingly uh, laminated different colors with the, the, the letter of the, the piano key on it. And he's been practicing and, and learning some songs. Mm-hmm. Excellent. That is music to my ears, even if it's not played correctly. Um, I'd love for him to eventually learn a stringed instrument. Mm-hmm. Um, but we wanted to build some basics with him with piano. But you mentioned your brother uh, was diagnosed with an atypical pervasive learning disability. Uh, was this originally an autism diagnosis? Yeah, and I think... it went right to... Yeah, I, th- I think... So, uh, I'm not sure... It, autism, certainly, it's, he's, he's somewhere on the spectrum, certainly. Um, and uh, he would uh, sort of spin tops for hours and just watch them or watch ceiling fans and that kind of thing. So, um, I think what, what made it atypical from sort of other uh, flavors of autism uh, was that and is that he uh, is extremely social, loves hanging out with people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's, they sort of didn't know what bucket to put it in. So the atypical pervasive just sort of <laughs> all the things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, autism is certainly part of it. But it is interesting how the human mind works and how music as a form of uh, almost, I'd want to say cognitive therapy, and maybe it is or isn't a therapy, but it, it connects certain neurons in the mind in ways that other activities can't. Did you find that your brother, or did your parents find that your brother made significant advancements once they started with music? Um, yeah, so it's hard to uh, gauge sorry, specific advancements, I think, just because uh, uh, it ends up being an anecdotal thing where it's like, well, this, just because, you know, and, and there's no, there's no, um, there, there's probably a slightly more uh, rigid way of judging things now, but back then in the early eighties, uh, even less so of a framework, sort of, sort of where, where the starting point is. But certainly my, my parents were told he would never hold a job, never be remotely self-sufficient. And that he, he works as a dishwasher in a, at a couple places locally. And has a very fulfilling, happy existence. Uh, he lives with my parents. Um, but I guess, so the, the, I think what, an, another metric, there's so many different ways to think about like how, what impact music has had in his life. And it has been massive. He still loves playing the piano. Um, he loves music. He, there are talent shows for, um, uh, like, uh, he, he, there's a, a social and um, mostly a social group that, that also does various kinds of arts uh, that, are, that, that he goes to that's part of at, at a uh, local university. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, there's a talent show every year. And the fact that he gets up with uh, a bunch of other, uh, like he gets up in front of all this entire crew of people and plays a piece in the piano just blows parents' minds uh, because he, uh, yeah, it's just not something you expect to come out of my brother and he, he's able to do it. So I think it, it, has, it has given him an enormous sense of pride uh, and of fulfillment and he loves doing it. He loves performing. Um, so for him, it's something that's been absolutely wonderful to, to sort of gauge what impact that's had is a lot harder. Uh, I, I tend to be a bit of a science nerd. I, I had a, uh, and, and so, um, am wary of, of, uh, uh, making pronouncements that I know I can't really back up. And so this is, this is one of those examples, uh, in terms of how far he's come, but, uh, it's just, I know that it's a thing that he values immensely that it has, is, makes his, uh, yeah, improves his quality of life immensely. And, um, that he's very proud of, which is awesome. So speaking of science nerd, you went to a Montessori school. Uh, you uh-huh. did really well academically growing up. Was science part of that, that passion for education from an early age? Oh, uh, you know, I think from an early age, the thing I was probably most passionate about was uh, video games and <laughs> uh, hanging out with my friends. I think uh, I wasn't, I like, I did, I did study um, hard enough to do well enough, I think. Um, but, uh, and I liked, I liked reading a lot. I liked science a lot. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I, I, uh, don't think I embraced, I'm now, I, I like, I really like 
teaching myself stuff. That's a thing that I've discovered as an adult. Um, as a kid, I don't know if it's as much a passion or a thing that I thought about as much. It was just like a thing that happened occasionally with like when I missed stuff in school or I was, I was really bad about not focusing properly in class and then would teach myself stuff later. And so it was more of a survival mechanism more than anything. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it was a thing that I think I, I, I'm, I'm, it's hard to gauge how much of this happened as a kid, but I know that when I was growing up, um, I did a lot of that, but I don't think I embraced it as a thing that really brings me joy until really my twenties when I started realizing I really like learning languages. Maybe I should just like start teaching myself some of this stuff or, uh, reading up on things or like, you know, using the internet in a way that's, um, productive as opposed to just, uh, whiling away time on the, the various social media platforms. Um, yeah. so yeah, as a kid, uh, there was, there was a lot of expectation placed on me with through my parents, not, not in like an unreasonable way, but just that they, um, you know, they sent us to a very solid, um, I was lucky enough to go to a private school and the Montessori before that. And, uh, that there were, there were expectations that we would work hard and do well. And my younger brother and I certainly, uh, I think met those expectations well enough. Um, but, but I don't think I, it would, the, the idea that learning was a thing that I was excited about wasn't a thing that really occurred to me until later in life, which has been a funny discovery. It's funny because uh, before I set off in this adventure in winemaking in the Finger Lakes, I was a lawyer. And the big joke about lawyers is unless you're a, a patent attorney, you're a lawyer because you weren't good with science or with math. And I go back and I think of what my first love was. My mm -hmm. first love was geology. Uh, I used to call myself a rock hound and would collect rocks everywhere we went. It's interesting how you talk about kind of that notion of being an autodidact, of almost having to find your passion and teach yourself. You find you retain it more. And you actually, in, in a lot of ways, I think when you have to teach yourself, you go to more sources, you build a, a wider repertoire for that education. Um, and I, I often thought about that as I came back in you know, really got into winemaking. This is full circle in my life. What a and, cool thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, one point of curiosity though, the LSAT is a challenging exam. How does that, how does that, how does that factor into the, the, uh, the lawyer joke about not necessarily being good at the other things? Like where, where does the LSAT figure into that, to that joke or does it not? It's so, you know, the LSAT is, is all about logical reasoning. Okay. And, that is obviously a skill you need in practice, specifically litigation or writing. Um, there's not a lot of number crunching and not a lot okay. of algebra or calculus. Mm -hmm. uh, so those would be obviously, I mean, it definitely helps with the SAT. Um, but when it comes to the LSAT, it, you're really trying to examine how somebody thinks and solves problems. Okay. Uh, so I think it's the numbers that scare potential lawyer, lawyers away or active lawyers. And I don't know how, how true it actually is. It's just one sure, of those yeah. things law school professors like to throw around. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you earned a Watson fellowship mm -hmm. and I was curious what led to that and what it entailed. Yeah. So, um, I, uh, was an undergrad at Williams college, which is a small school in Western Mass and, um, a liberal arts college. And I uh, was majoring in biology at the time um, and ended up majoring in biology. But uh, my junior year, so at Williams, there's, a, there's a, a winter study class, which is basically a month in January where you can study all sorts of things. You can study yoga, you can do something academic on a thesis, you can, the whole, the whole breadth of, of uh, opportunity is there. And I, uh, one year, took a singer, singing and songwriting class, or excuse me, a songwriting class for that winter study uh, that a bunch of other friends from the singing group that I was in had done and uh, really, really liked it. And uh, that was the first time I had done really much like creative writing. Uh, I, I hadn't done a lot of, I hadn't really taken any poetry classes or any um, fiction writing or anything like that. And so that, that was the first time I was getting to sort of make stuff up and it was really thrilling. So um, after that, joined up with a few other friends who, had, who were in the class, who had taken the class, and we started writing. And the, the first iteration of the band actually existed in college, and we actually released an, e, re, released, we released an EP that uh, we have buried 
deep underground that is inaccessible <laughs> at this point. It was called the January EP, and it has six songs that you hopefully will never hear. Um, <laughs> but we released it, and we were very proud of it at the time. And um, the Watson Fellowship is this crazy uh, fellowship floating out there. Um, Thomas J. Watson was a guy who founded IBM, and his kids put it together. And it's basically a dream fellowship where you get uh, a chunk of money. At that point, it was 25 grand or so to do something that you want to study, study something you want to study, but it's non-academic. So the rules at that, at that point, and I think they persist, uh, were that you cannot go to countries you've been to before. So the idea is you're sort of out of your comfort zone. You can't uh, work or be in school. So you are out, if you're studying something, like even if you're studying something that's on the um, more academic side, sort of the effects of like genomic crop farming, you are out there talking to farmers and maybe interviewing people at universities, but you are not taking classes. You are, it's like, it's field work basically for a year in like places where you may, might not speak the language. Um, and uh, the requirements are, so, so to, to apply, you basically like describe what this year would look like. You do the research, you sort of describe what countries you would go to and how you would use the funds to like travel and sort of get around, like whether you would take language classes, et cetera. So you, you sort of, um, the application is, is describing what your dream year would look like. And then um, they interview, they, there are 50 colleges that submit four people each, and they pick 50 people from that pool. So um, I was really excited about songwriting at that point and thought it would be very cool to study self-expression in different styles of traditional music around the globe. Um, and I think one of the biggest things for that, that, that sort of, I was really excited about this and really excited to go study stuff and, and just be out there for a year. I, I, I opposed going to Ireland, Brazil, and Turkey. Um, and in terms of what, how one wins it, I think um, dumb luck is a big part of it. And um, also just like being really excited about the thing and, and yeah. expressing that excitement through the application and through um, the planning of it and through the enthusiasm in the interview. So uh, it's not as though, like what, what I was proposing wasn't anything groundbreaking. And in fact, the, you, you learn over the course of the fellowship that the point of the fellowship isn't necessarily for you to study the thing. It's really like get you out of your comfort zone and give you time. And like, like it, it's a very strange thing to be, to have like, for me at least, to, uh, to have been through uh, high school and college where I was primarily focused on satisfying uh, the demands of others, whether they were teachers or parents, or et cetera, and getting grades and being judged favorably generally. Um, and then existing in a world where like no one is judging anything. I'm just some random guy in Ireland who's talking to a guy who's sip, just four Guinnesses deep next to me about why he likes playing music. Then I go home and just think about what I'm doing. And uh, it was it, it, and the, the only requirements for the fellowship are the every three months you write a three page paper, which is ludicrous because you could do one of those every day about like the tr trials and tribulations of what's happening. And then at the end, you give a 10 minute presentation. So it's in, it's nuts like that's a, it's that, that part of it is almost a joke um but it's extremely cool and i i over the course of that year went from thinking i should I'm, i was planning on becoming a doctor i'd taken the mcats uh and or, or was planning to apply to med school excuse me um and then over the course of that year realized that maybe i should try going around with other stuff and mm. like i did a lot of writing did a lot of blogging and that was really enjoyable to have um that was that was sort of the no, that wasn't not creative writing of course but just informal non academic writing um, and that was one of the first times that I'd done a large amount of that and really really for an audience of my family and friends um, and really enjoyed it so that kind of gave me it was sort of a, a funny intersection of something being um, prestigious is a weird word to use but something that was sort of acceptable to my parents as a next step from college where I was like this is a thing that you can do but also so uh, aggressively non academic that it put me in a place where I was able to critically think about whether I wanted to do any of the stuff that I thought I would be doing, which was mostly uh, thinking in terms of professional school, et cetera. Um, so it was a, a very funny intersection of those two things. And um, I'm very grateful. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, I also have some, some of those basement tapes hidden away that hopefully no one ever uncovers from my high school bands. <laughs> oh, what kind of music do you, please do tell what, what instruments do you play or what, what did you play or? So I was the singer and just sort of rhythm guitar player. Oh, cool. Uh, never exceptionally talented, but I can manage the chords. Yeah, and, great. Uh, so Do I you still play or sing at all? You know, I, I still love singing. Um, mm -hmm. I don't play as much as I'd like. I oftentimes, I, I have my guitar in my home office and I look at it. I just, I need to make more time for it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a we, tricky thing. 
we had one uh, more kind of electronic uh, style band when Cakewalk, the pro audio was still a, a really big thing and you were able to make music on your computer. And that band was called Melk, which was okay. a terrible band name. M-E-L-K? And kind of a M-E-L-K, yeah. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> and then uh, a Simon and Garfunkel-esque band called Crestfallen. And every song was truly Crestfallen. So. Yeah, no, I, I think every song I wrote, for the, the first, like the first 10 to, to two dozen were certainly very Crestfallen songs. Sad. <laughs> You know, they say, if you want to be a writer, write. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is just that continued use of those muscles uh, that help to push you through with innovation. Uh, Your kind of experience in Galway is fascinating to me. So Galway is a city I've been to and love. I think it is probably my favorite place in Ireland. Uh, The combination of the history uh, just even the nightlife in Galway is great. It's a university town, so you've got that kind of younger energy. Uh, I think about Ireland a lot. In some ways, you know, obviously some of my heritage comes from there. But as much as there is joy in Irish literature and song, there is a constant sense of melancholy as well. And I think about how that relates to music, you know, Like I said, our little coffee shop group in high school, we wrote a lot of sad songs. Like, I love Elliot Smith. When I hear some of those sorts of songs, some of those minor keys, like, it doesn't impact me to feel sad. It doesn't make me depressed. It actually is like a a security blanket almost. I don't know if that's, you know, some sort of genetic thing, but I know I'm not alone. Do you find that at all? yourself yeah definitely i think um so i might be misquoting uh a professor from williams here who i never took a class from but i've benefited from the william the educations of the other guys in the band since we all went to school together and um do often do academic or like uh creative writing exercises so uh this is something that was i'm, I'm repeating secondhand uh jim shepherd is uh, an excellent author and a guy who teaches english at um williams and he this again i'm now i'm the, the more now that i built it up i'm going to totally flub what he actually said but along the lines of um there's only like happy stories or ha- stories that are that are super happy aren't terribly interesting or happy families perhaps just there's one it's just like the same thing whereas sad mm-hmm. stories there's such a breath uh like there's so much so many things that can go wrong and that 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 uh, and that or that, that's the gist of it what i understood it to be which is just that like the idea of this like single beautiful thing that is there the utopian like this is this is what the, like the, the, uh this is how stories should go uh almost seem seem fairy taleish where it's like well that's fake um yeah. whereas the the the, the uh, range of emotions that that a sad story can draw out of you is so much greater and i think with songs um yeah so what you were talking about in terms of uh a security blanket i think to know one there's there's just sadness on one level of just like i'm sad about this thing and then there's also a loneliness that exists within sadness i think a lot of times where it's like no one else understands where i'm coming from and when you hear someone uh in elliot smith or the smiths or whoever uh describe some of those feelings i don't know why i focused on people with the last name smith there but i did uh mm-hmm. describing these 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 feelings um that had previously been something that you'd only made sense of in your own head uh, and doing it elegantly and with, with set to music, it can be extremely moving in a way that, yeah, it doesn't bring you down, but sort of is, is a, is a place you can go. Uh, it's sort of like a safe space where it's like, this is, this is whoever wrote this is the fact that this resonates with me and that someone else chose to write it. It sort of, it makes me feel like I am part of something bigger. So I think it, it, the way you described it is very much how I think about um, a lot of sad music uh, or music. That's not even not sad is just like, stuff that's not um, objectively upbeat, I think. Um, and there's, yeah. there's a lot of magic in the, the, that kind of music. It is true. It's almost like the, there's this marriage of these two ideas that perfection actually is boring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, right. But that, you know, in, in whatever sense of isolation you think you might be experiencing, you actually are not alone. You know, it, that sort of leads me just to a general philosophical question. Um, how would you define beauty? How would I define beauty? Yeah, this is a big, this is big. Um, so I 
I think um, this takes uh, I, I want to touch on something we had spoken about before, which was uh, craft and art and how those two things intersect. And um, I think one thing that defines that line for me, uh, which I think, again, is a very subjective line, is when something just moves me or inspires me to feel things that I did not expect to feel from or just like getting a, a hit by a wave of emotion. And I think that can happen in so many different ways. It can happen uh, while being served a meal that reminds you of like a, your grandparents' house, however many miles away. Uh, with and grandparents who are no longer around, and, and to the, have that that there there is a beauty in in a, in a meal that doesn't need to be a thing that is um. It can be extremely simple, um, or it can be extremely mm -hmm. complex. I think, and it, it, the but to be moved by a thing, and so it's a very I think, the, the experience of beauty I think is a very personal one, um, that is, uh, contextualized by that like the 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 uh, breadth of experience that that, that individual has had. And what is crazy to me is when different people can experience beauty in the same piece of art, same bit of food, same glass of wine, uh, coming from such diff from, from very different places, like necessarily different places. And that there's something that's very cool and crazy that I don't understand about that. So like, I don't expect that the, the bits of beauty that I find are going to be universal to everyone, but I do know that there, there there's something uh um, like almost religious about the fact that there are things that that resonate extremely strongly with people from very different places and it's not as simple as something that is well made i think um like a the, the going back to the craft i think there are uh craft and beauty like something that's well crafted and something that's beautiful are there's a lot of overlap in those things um but it's they're not uh they're not always the same or necessarily the same or even necessarily often the same i think you can have uh like a, you, you can, one can say that a, a house or a piece of writing is is well done, but entering that space or reading that story might not move you. Whereas something, um, it, there's something that's very intangible about it, and so it's it's hard to put one's finger on. But I think yes, it's because I think that by dint of the fact that the uh, sorry that I'm thinking out loud as as this is coming out, but the no, um, it, it it is, I think by definition almost subjective. It is just how. You well, how it makes the individual, the 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 the, the uh, consumer of that bit of beauty feel, and that so that, that that's I think where I sit on it. Probably, it's interesting. You know, I I only ask because I think about this topic a lot. Uh, I think I think beauty can dictate a lot of the decisions we make, like, like in almost every realm, and and in a way that uh, ascribes to things or activities or ideas. Uh, beauty, which we don't usually think of as beauty. And so I, I'm just gathering as many data points as possible, constructing that myself. I, along those lines, uh, I tend to think of it as, as specific resonating embellishments, right? Because you can have two buildings that are nearly identical, but someone may have taken a painstaking effort to make some small personal mm -hmm. adjustments to that, which which I, I just find fascinating. Uh, it happens in wine. You're right. Like there are wines, which some people may not like that are truly beautiful because they're the most authentic expression of someone's land and someone's thought process. And so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think I, it's, uh, there's also something about even divorcing it from like, there's beauty that, that, created beauty that's created by people i almost want to yeah. put stuff in two different buckets where there's beauty that's created by people and there's beauty that's just there like a piece of perfectly ripe fruit that you just plucked off of a tree there's something that is like uh uh unbelievably beautiful about that that is not a part of it is i think it's beyond what people can make it is just a thing that you can't experience by a person's hand and so um something there's the bucket that involves someone's hand and some someone clearly putting care and then there's something that is just like otherworldly that is how did that pair grow i i don't fully understand i know the biology of it kind of but the fact that it's there is there's something that, that, that's very beautiful about that too <laughs> definitely so i would love to talk about the band uh first of all darling side where the name comes from uh the fact that some friendships in college led to really y your artistic expression but also your business and how some of those dynamics work yeah, definitely. So the band name where that comes from, this typically when we are asked this on stage, 
and we have to answer is uh, that we play a game of not answering and sort of passing the buck to the next guy. Uh, but here it's just me, so I can't really do that. But just know that if, if this were asked in, um, in, in, a, in a forum where there were more than one band member, um, you would not know from whom it was going to come. Uh, but uh, the, so it, I mentioned a um, singing or songwriting class that uh, all of us ended up taking at Williams during the Jan term, uh, like a winter study class. And uh, the teacher of that class, her name is Bernice Lewis. She's a wonderful woman, singer-songwriter, um, based in the Berkshires of Massachusetts. And uh, she, there's a quote that she likes to um, put forward in the class uh, that I think is now attributed to Sir Arthur Quiller Couch, who was like a literary critic in England a long time ago. I don't know exactly when. Um, yeah. the, a century that that and that this is something the like 18th or 17th something like that. Um, but uh, he um, he said you have to kill your darlings. Um, so and by that I think my understanding of what he meant is that uh, the the your one's favorite bits of a piece of art that you are producing or a a, a piece of work that you're producing is are often the bits of it. Uh, if you're that attached to it, it's probably something that is keeping the, the work back or holding the work back from being a cohesive piece. Um, and so Darling Side uh, was initially conceived of as sort of like a, a cousin of fratricide or patricide or uh, insecticide. Um, but the C spelling felt a little more morbid than uh, at that point we were also writing. I think you described it as what was the sad songs, but you just, how did you describe the, the first songs you were writing? Crestfallen. Yeah. A lot of crestfallen songs. So Darling Side with a C felt a little more like thrash metal uh, to us. Yeah. So we changed it to an S, Darling Side, a little softer. Uh, and that is the name of the band. And then as far as how the band got together, we um, uh, there was a version of the band that existed as a seven-person group, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, that has a, an EP that none of you out there in podcast world will be able to access. I'm grateful to hear, tell you because it's not on any of the platforms. Um, and then we... Uh, there was a year I, I did the Watson Fellowship where I was roaming around for a year. A few other guys were either finishing up school or also similarly wandering around. And then we reformed um, as a five piece with a slightly different lineup uh, and all moved into a house together after our youngest guys graduated in the fall. Uh, so we, we, they graduated in um, end of spring, summer, June of 2009, and we moved into a house together that fall. Mm. Uh, some wonderful landlords who were still we're still in touch with um and uh are uh continue to be big supporters of the band as like if you think about where your mindset needs to be in order to allow five college kids to say like we're gonna be in a band we live in your house uh to to then allow them to live in the house you must be either a spectacular person or a little bit nutty they are uh they are spectacular people <laughs> and maybe a little nutty too but in a great way uh so we we love them very much and uh, yeah they were that they were a huge part of our ability to, to just get things done from the outset um and yeah, as far as how, so we, we came to it as friends uh, from school of uh, four of us uh, out of that initial five piece, four of us were in a singing group together, um, an acapella group in college, and all of us were pretty close and or extremely close and got closer. And I think that informed how we uh, operate as a business and as a band. Um, a lot of people ask, and by a lot of people, I mean, sometimes one person might ask me, what's it like to be in a band? Uh, and my answer to it is to that question is that it's it's a non-answer which is sort of the question itself is similar to what's it like being in a family uh there are many different kinds of families some of them are wonderful some of them are utterly dysfunctional and most of them are somewhere in between so you, you sort of the, the band is a small business where the art or the, the product happens to be the art you're making but you can design it structure it however you want uh for instance um you can imagine in a band, uh, say Chris and the Mystics, if you if that were a band, then you have a pretty good idea how that band's structured. Chris is kind of in charge of what's happening, and the Mystics are kind of just hanging out, doing whatever, um, probably hired guns, etc. Uh, whereas if you have, uh, so like the, that, that style of band where there's clearly a front person who's doing the thing, um, often that is the person who's also doing a lot of the songwriting and business leadership, etc. And he, he or she is hiring other folks out to um, tour or to record, etc. Yeah. Um, we are on the other end of that spectrum, which is to say we're like stubbornly and aggressively democratic about everything. So everything needs to like all four of us get credit on everything. And that, that was something that came about when uh, we were starting to write, which is um, 
as I mentioned, I was doing booking at the outset, and I was so obsessed with doing a good job of that that I did spend not much time writing or on the music mm-hmm. side of stuff. And uh, the way that the music industry is structured, um, uh, or at least the way that writers uh, of songs are rewarded, is that it's not necessarily like there, there are uh, writing credits and performing credits that exist um, when you register a song with a, a performing rights organization and or the, the people that collect money from venues, etc. Um, and royalties from radio. Um, and you, uh, if you, so they're, they're, the, the person who writes the song, basically, the writer uh, is separate from a performer. So if you write a song as a band, um, if only one person writes it and that's how you register the song, if the song blows up, the person who's the writer is stands to gain a lot more than the folks who are just performing it. And that can create some perverse incentives. If, for instance, you are uh, in a band with four, three other people and um, you think that I, I could bring this song that I've been working on over to one of the other guys and then we could work on it together and then bring it to the band. But if I finish it by myself and I know it's going to be a big hit because I only write big hits, Darling said it's never been a big, big hit, by the way, um, uh, that, uh, that maybe I don't want to share it. So maybe I'll just like work on it on my own and keep it to myself. So you, you can see how quickly things, it stops being as functional of a band situation. What we decided was that no matter who wrote it, um, everyone gets credit for it, which we were, of course, not the first people to do. I think, uh, uh, you know, there, there are plenty of bands in the past who have had that mentality of just anything that the band is doing together, everyone gets credit for. But part of that thinking was that I was spending a lot of time doing booking, for, for instance, which was necessary for the band to progress, but there isn't a financial compensation for being a decent booking agent outside of maybe getting compliments from a winemaker down the road on your email prowess. But like, it's not like you're not going to get money, make money off of that ability. Uh, so we decided that like, because we wanted to, to because everyone was working, every way we trusted, everyone is going sort of all in on the band. Um, all credit is equally split, no matter who actually wrote the thing, because that's just mm. that's a like capitalist perversion that exists that we aren't going to like subscribe to. We're just going to say all of us are part of this project. That's how we're presenting. And that has that also is how we think about all business stuff as well. It's just like typically there, there's sort of there's an unspoken hierarchy in terms of who's most aware of what's happening. Um, Mm-hmm. And that goes for a whole range of things, both within the business. For instance, Harris, our cellist, does all, all, all of our accounting business stuff. He's our primary um, point of contact with our business manager, et cetera. So I tend to trust Harris on that stuff. But I know that if I had an issue with something, I could voice it and I would have equal say as any other band member, um, yeah. even though he's sort of the person who's kind of in charge of that. And that plays a role in, in musical stuff, too, I think. Um, I, for instance, don't have I, I have a kind of an attenuated range of hearing. I can't hear bass very well. So hmm. although I have an equal say on what's happening in the base, I don't really tell what's happening some of the time. I know that I know that he's been moving around, but I'm not going to flex that. I'm not I'm not sort of the, the, the person. I'm, it's not it's not it's just because it's democratic doesn't mean everyone is always weighing in equally on all the things. Um, but to know that that is that is uh, something that is welcomed and exists is a very cool thing. And I feel very it, 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 although that one one cost of this process, I should mention, is that we are massively slow moving as a band um, when all stuff. But uh, but I'm happy to say that there are very few regrets we have in terms of the stuff we put out, which is a nice thing. I think one of the perks of being so slow moving and democratic is that things get discussed in depth and often too much. But um, we end up feeling good about the stuff that we put out, which is a, a very nice thing. To have. You know, despite my high school dreams of stardom in music, uh, I hadn't really thought much about it until I was preparing for this interview. How much a band like Darling Side is like a family business. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I guess the, the main difference is you've, you've chosen each other to work with. Um, but how that can complicate so many different aspects. I'm, I'm happy to hear that you guys seem to have found a place that works for everybody really well. Because that yeah. hopefully just means the, the group's along, uh, around a lot longer. And we get oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, we are trying to keep it sustainable. And sometimes, um, sometimes that can take like that, that uh, desire to exist as a band. Uh, to sustain can manifest in funny ways in that um, uh, Dave, our bassist, is a man that I love very much. Um, he and I were freshman year roommates. We have spent a lot of time with each other. And there are times where um, he's informed me I can be a little much for him. And and I, he, I've informed him that he can be a little much for me sometimes. And so part of happiness for us is like when we have a long tour, he and I keep our distance a little bit. And that keeps us both happy to exist on stage. But like, it's a thing that it, it's not like it, there, there's... That, that those similar dynamics exist with all of us, but Dave and I have a particularly like one that one have a very particular history having um, been freshman roommates, et cetera. So 
sometimes that you know love for one another and the desire to keep the band happy as a whole can involve like giving each other a little or a lot of space uh depending on the scenario and i think that's been one of the things that's been very educational for me i think in the band is that uh yeah, it, 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 one way that we often describe it or that I often describe it is a four-way sexless marriage um, where it's just like, you're just, you got to be talking. All, and this is, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not, of course, but I'm someone who's not married. So I don't actually yeah. know what a normal two-way marriage is like. But uh, <laughs> what I imagine it is, uh, multiply that by two and remove some of the fun parts. And then you end up with a uh, darling side. And uh, the, yeah, like it, it, there's, it, in order to um, exist, somewhat functionally, you have to be able to express to other people what you need. But before you do that, you have to figure out what it is you yourself need. And that takes some work sometimes because what you think you need might be pretty different from what you've, this is going to get verbally complicated, thought you've needed in the past. Like it, it, it's yeah. like sometimes what you need and, and the, the road or touring can, can um, very much accelerate that learning process because you are without a lot of things that you depend on um, when you are away from home. It's but, like Bob uh, Dylan said. You know, they may know what you want, but I know what you need. Yeah, right. There's that difference. So, uh huh. Yeah, determining determining that 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 what what that difference is, and then being comfortable enough with it to express it to the other to the rest of the guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're very fortunate to have like I feel very fortunate to be in a group with three very thoughtful, considerate people. Um, and so there's there, we there's a lot of like it, it, for in fact one thing we've started to do now before we write for a new album is to just like have feelings talks for a few rehearsals where it's just like, we just sit down and everyone talks about their feelings. And it can be like, this is something I've been thinking about with my relationship with my parents or my kid or my X, Y, or Z, or, um, and just getting, figuring out where we, where we all are. And just so we have a point of reference for that kind of stuff. But, um, it's a lot of communication or at least for us to, to stay, um, in a happy place as a touring group, uh, or touring and writing group, um, and creative group is, is, uh, to, to communicate an immense amount. Speaking of which, you know, unfortunately, there hasn't been much touring, I imagine, in the last year. Uh, did that, I know that has to be a really hard financial hit, but did that in any way strengthen some of your writing together, even if you were doing it long distance? Yeah, I mean, certainly. Um, it, it, there, there, there have been some silver linings of the pandemic for the band, for sure. Um, we, First off, in terms of the financial hit, there's, of course, that's something that we depend on. But um, I'm very grateful to say we did not get hit as hard as a lot of our friends did, um, just because we were planning on having a slightly slower summer um, of 2020 anyway. Uh, Harris, one of our guys, our cellist, uh, and his wife had, uh, were planning on and then successfully did have a child. So our, our strategy for, for paternity leave is that when one person has a child, everyone gets paternity leave because you can't, <laughs> can't make four-person decisions with three people. Yeah, so it's wonderful. Um, and so we were planning on having a slightly slower year. So it gave, gave us a little more time to sort of figure our stuff out um, because we weren't uh, scrambling to like figure out where we were going to make the money that we had expected to make over the course of the summer with the festivals because we weren't playing any of those festivals. So um, we've been like, and, and we also have a wonderful team with us, a, a business manager, a manager who helped us weather the storm um, about as well as I think a band could have. So we're feeling quite grateful with, for that. Um, so, uh, but but it's unquestionably been extremely hard on the arts industry in general. And we're yeah, um, yeah very excited to, to kick back into things. But in terms of how that's affected us, um, I think, uh, so yeah, our, our, our uh, remote writing and workflow has been something that we've had to figure out. And mm-hmm. uh, we were starting to do a little more of that because uh, just like the other guys live, we're living in um, Waltham, which is a, um, suburb of Boston. And I, uh, was in Cambridge at the time. So we, there was like a, you know, I, I, it's like a 50 minute bike ride. So I was trying to like, rather than bike two hours a day, it was like, what if I just came in some days and we we're working that out. And then all of a sudden we weren't seeing each other at all. And, um, we're, that's been really cool. I think, uh, one of the, like we, we were split between one, one in Texas, one in Kansas and two in Massachusetts for a bunch of the pandemic. And, uh, we're still able to, to have been figuring out how to like work together and make things happen. And I think that's going to inform how we continue to write in the future. I think first, like there's going to be a lot of gratitude when we're able to get together and just sit and write for a while in person uh, for a bit, but also knowing that we have the flexibility to sort of be in different places is something that um, is, is really nice for us. So it's, I think it's probably less of a strengthening the writing and more learning that our writing is a little more 
um, uh, or that, that we can we we are able to make things work from a distance. Uh, or it's a little more flexible than we had, had maybe anticipated, which mm-hmm. allows for a lot of a little more personal freedom and flexibility. Which uh, I, I, this is something that is a corollary to some of the stuff I discussed before. But in terms of um, how we think about the band moving forward, is just it's everyone needs to be happy. And so whatever that means, if like, if we've set early on, it was sort of, we'd set time off and then we get a big opportunity. If someone has booked that time off with whatever thing, the thing is, if it's like their girlfriend's dog's brother's uh, event, that's time off. We're respecting that time off. Now things are a little different, of course, with families and other stuff, but just that we are not pushing everyone to sort of like move as much as we want. For instance, I might want to tour a little more than the other guys, but I strongly prefer being in a band that is touring a little less and happy than I prefer being in a band that is touring a little mm. more and profoundly sad, crestfallen. Yeah. So uh, we are, so, so part of that is I think maxim like in, increasing the ability for each of us to do our own thing and be happy and still be contributing to the band in a um, uh, significant way is um, really valuable to us. So I think, I think it's probably increased band health uh, or um, happiness, certainly um, to, to know that we can do that now, but I don't, and, and I'm sure that there are ways in which writing remotely changes that. Um, I think there are, we're, we're all in, there's, there's a broad range of, of um, life points is a really bad way to describe anything, but I'm going to use it. Um, points in our lives maybe is a little slightly more poetic. Uh, you know, there are a couple guys with kids. Um, there are, uh, I'm, I'm like living in my parents' basement right now, hanging out and excited to get back to New England. But there, there, anyway, there's, there's a range of things that's happening here. So um, the, the, uh, Yes, I suppose that that's going to, there's going to be a, there's so many different ways to spin this stuff. I guess it, it's, it's, um, it feels, it feels it, right now, uh, just to get meta for a moment, I feel like a little bit, I'm sort of describing a marketing strategy for what we could talk about for the next album when we say like, well, how did the pandemic, did it strengthen the writing? Yeah, it strengthened the writing. What are the ways in which it maybe strengthened the writing? I don't fully know, but I do know that it's putting us, it's the way we're getting out of it is in a place where we are, um, I, I feel that we are stronger as a group um, just because of what it's allowed each of us to do individually. Yeah. It's funny when the <clears throat> pandemic struck, obviously we had months where no one was going anywhere. I actually found myself for a few days going back to the postal service and thinking about how they reportedly wrote that and you know, yeah. what almost 20 years ago at this point, mm-hmm. but all just through the mail, uh, sending yeah. track after track to each other and kind of thinking about where, what that might do for music with some folks. So, yeah. Uh, one thing I was curious about with you is with, with winemaking, there's like, did you have like the, how, how much interaction was there with other winemakers, other folks in the region before the pandemic hit? And then how much, what, how did that change? Like how, how, how did that affect your process as a winemaker? Yeah, it, it's been hard. You know, when we are a, a region that is focused on camaraderie, uh, some of my best friends either have wineries or are winemakers. And so what does that mean? That means like seeing them once a week, visiting their cellar, having uh-huh. a family meal together. Um, and that just really hasn't happened. It's been the combination of one concern about the disease. And then as things are opening up, just sort of a race to get all of these things done for new ways of operating for new ideas to implement so many different changes in the way we, we run our business. There is uh, a hunger for kind of more interpersonal contact. It's actually one of the reasons why I launched the podcast. It was Mm -hmm. a chance for me to start to see my friends again. You know, the podcast is a lot of wine, but it's not just wine. It's, it's these cultural issues like we're talking about uh, and music and art and, and launching the podcast was a way to say to friends like Scott Osborne at Fox Run and, uh, you know, uh, Paul Brock from Silver Thread, just different winemakers and owners. Let's have a chance to catch up a little bit in a safe, you know, somewhat distanced environment where there aren't a lot of people around. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I miss it. I miss it desperately. And I'm looking forward to getting back at, at least into some of the rhythms that we had in the past. Yeah, and seeing some live music. I'm sorry I missed you guys when you came through Ithaca last year. We will be That's back through the area, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. Touring is, feels like such a long, far away dream. I'm, it's going to feel so good to just be playing in front of people. And we've done a couple live streams since um, since the pandemic hit, which have been 
really fun and, and it's been rewarding to just get back in a room with those guys but to get to play in front of an audience is going to be that, that's probably my favorite part of existing as a musician um there's so many different similar to running any small business i think um there are so many different things that you can do and some of them you might really enjoy some of you don't enjoy as much and uh for me writing and getting to play live are two of the highlights so i'm looking forward to that very much yeah uh, if we can talk just a few minutes about some of the songs and upcoming yeah, music. Sure. And by the way, I, I may not have been able to get to live shows, but it's probably just it's a short period of time and I got the kids running around. But that Tiny Desk concert uh, from NPR is constantly on our YouTube streaming on oh, the TV. Cool. So my son Appreciate loves it, it too. Well, just then I said, you hey, and thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, I know this question has come up, but I want to just talk about on a couple other levels. I, I love the whole album extra life. Um, some people have described it as a concept album. Some people say it's not, uh, there does seem to be like an emotional theme to it. And I think a lot of that, it just in my interpretation culminates in, in Eschaton, the song. Um, there are people, and I, I guess I'm going to ask you, is it, is this inspired by infinite jest from David Foster Wallace? Yeah. So, um, the way we write or the way we wrote that album uh, was a lot of throwing like one person would come up with a, an idea. Um, and then that would get thrown to the next person and they would like tear it apart and put back together with some of the bits that they liked. And then that would get passed on to the next person where they would tear it apart. And so the initial, um, the initial idea for that song was, I think called the, 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 the working title was red rocking chair um, because red rocking chair was somewhere in the course. and I, it had picked around for probably since the inception of the band, like, so since like 2009, um, hmm. Dave and I had been sort of singing that tune, uh, playing around with it. And I had read Infinite Jest a while before. And so really enjoyed some of the weird, like that's a strange, strange book, uh, <laughs> that, that has some very enjoyable imagery and crazy characters in it. And so, um, I just, uh, what in polite company, I would say borrow, but here I'm going to say stole just various bits of things. And inserted them into the song, passed that along to, to the other guys, and some of them made it through their sort of sieve filter and, uh, and on and on. So certainly the, the, bits of that, the, the bits of imagery were inspired by the book, but to say that the song itself was um, is probably uh, not entirely accurate, but, it's, um, mm. but to, to describe it shorthand that way is totally fine. But it's, um, yeah, it, it, because of the way we write where it's sort of, it, like the other three guys just to, um, put it out there have not read the book and almost certainly won't so there it is it, the, the, the it's more that those images some weird images from the from the book that i had taken from them like tennis stars being martyred etc yeah. resonated with the other guys in a way that had nothing to do with the book and so i'd say maybe it's like a quarter inspired by that that novel and the rest of it is not at all um yeah some thoughts that i had on that was uh you know, David Foster Wallace really seemed to have gotten to this point conveyed in his writing, this frustration with uh, how irony had become one of the dominant sort of motifs in American culture, everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so ironic. And you had other people writing around that time. Uh, Jedediah Purdy wrote for common things as a young man, uh, just saying, what are we doing in our country? We're not recognizing the valuable things. I, I find that because I'll be honest, like I, th that resonates with me too. Um, one of the, th the opposites of that is an embracing uh, of the nature of the earnest. I, mm -hmm. I feel like if you are earnest, it is automatically something that people disregard anymore uh, about almost anything. But to me, like that is one of the great human qualities, like to have a deep, curious, uh, passion that is serious, um, but also kind of lighthearted at the same time about whether it be relationships, passion projects. Uh, I find that there is an earnestness in some ways to Darling Side's music. For you or for other members of the band, do you, do you identify with that idea that we are a culture that is too ironic, uh, too sarcastic? Um, yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, I, I certainly hear what you're saying in terms of 
uh, earnestness sometimes being equated with simple mindedness or, uh, or like sort of the idea of I think of um, there, there's an element of sort of the, the, the there's a lot of value that I think is, I, I have trouble speaking in broad strokes about society because sometimes I feel like I don't understand what's yeah. happening in the first place <laughs> uh, at all. Yeah. But I'm just going to wing it right now. Um, there's uh, a lot of value that's placed on worldliness, or at least in certain circles, of course, um, the, the, the uh, maybe uh, coastal values, perhaps, uh, mm-hmm. the, 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 uh, on worldliness and not being that impressed by a lot of things. And that, I think, can go hand in hand with just like, with with this just general disdain for what is produced and just being or like a willingness to mock everything and i'm mm-hmm. someone who i mock plenty of stuff so i'm i'm not i'm not suggesting that i'm i'm on the, the hyper earnest side <laughs> we of all things. love our memes <laughs> yeah yeah right so i'm i'm there but um but i also think that there is a lot of joy to be had that is not being had in just celebrating Small things, and I, I, I'm as as these words are coming out of my mouth. I'm remembering that I get in trouble sometimes with my brother and Dave and a few other folks for not celebrating, co-celebrating is the word that we use for just like just mm. being really into it. And I sometimes yeah. get in trouble for not co-celebrating hard enough. So it, perhaps this is a lesson that I should be uh, taking more so than giving. Um, but, but yeah, I think um, that the, the, the uh, and again, uh, having retired from social media, I I'm feel I feel largely unplugged from a lot of the the um the most prominent perhaps sort of uh cultural waves that are being ridden i read about them a few days later in like whatever news source so um i'm not i'm not at the at uh, like riding the wave but um but it is something that i think to not or it's 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 certainly an exercise that i am i think about and i'm working on mm-hmm. which is to uh not is to to i think like with i guess so I'm, I'm thinking backwards now but the idea that you are ironic or sarcastic about a whole breadth of things is just that comes that has that nest in, in my mind that necessarily comes from a place of like understanding what actually is the case and you're sort of like well this is this is a little this etc and i think being feeling m- more free to not be as confident uh that you know what's happening is it is that's an exercise at least that i'm working on is that to 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 um think well actually maybe i don't fully understand how this works so maybe i shouldn't mock it i still might and do a bad job of it but but it's um i think and and that i think comes from us that that a lot lot with 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 the news etc there's every people are in separate silos you have like a liberal silo, a conservative silo, uh, an academic one, etc. Uh, and and part of adulthood, I think, also is just that you you are supposed to be master of your domain. You're you're supposed to sort of understand everything that's going on, and that is directly at odds with this like a childlike wonder of like, what is happening? I don't fully understand it. And I think balancing those two things of being able to understand what you do understand, but then not uh, turn a sarcastic, ironic eye towards pretty much everything else is a tricky thing. Um, because there, there, it, there's, it, there's a vulnerability there. Um, and I think, uh, it's hard, it's just generally hard to be vulnerable in terms of like, I guess my, part of my issue with talking about whether we are in an ironic time now is that I have so little context for what previous times have been like. Um, I, I don't, I don't, maybe they were just as ironic. I don't know. There's some ironic people back in the 1800s from what I understand. So I don't know, um, that this is that we've reached, we've reached peak irony. Um, but, but it certainly feels like there is a pressure just, uh, just as a, a uh, an, an adult roaming around this landscape uh, to to not um, or to just be like master of your own domain and understanding what's happening and um, I think that often goes hand in hand with with uh, a, 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 like a small amount of condescension towards things that you don't fully understand or things that are outside of it and to be able to interact with things that are outside of your domain without being sarcastic, ironic, etc. can be a hard thing sometimes. So that was a long winded answer to your question, but um, yeah, I think we're we're on similar pages. No, I think it makes sense though to to be willing to question mm-hmm. whatever it is means that you are more vulnerable 
because it means you don't necessarily have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And we are already insecure as individuals to add that extra layer of insecurity in the context of how we live our lives today. Um, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. It's a tricky thing. Yeah. Um, so we're going to let you go. I, I do want to hear about the new album and, uh, you've released, uh, there's one song uh, available from it right now, correct? So, um, the, the, we released an album back in, um, the fall, uh, called fish pond fish. Uh, yep. and that, that, um, that is the last release we've done. And then we are currently like starting to piece together some new material and figure out what the next bit of uh, bit is, but we haven't released any uh, sneak peeks of anything for the future. As far as I know, but okay, maybe someone's surprising me. <laughs> no. Um, well, I'm really looking forward to it. The, uh, the kind of collaborations you've been doing with Henry Jameson mm -hmm. have been delightful surprises thanks to he's up. a he's such a funny man i really if you have you ever caught a live show of his no i highly encourage you to do that he's extremely enjoyable um in, in fact yeah he's, he's he's a um he's someone whom we've known within the music scene since yeah pretty close to uh when we started so like 2010 probably um and is uh yeah is, is a lot of fun to hang out with yeah no they keep them coming they're wonderful Thank you very much. Uh, so I did have a chance to send you some wines uh, before we did the interview. They were so good. Yeah. Or we've had, we've had, <laughs> we've gone through two bottles so far and have thoroughly enjoyed them. Well, good. Uh, hopefully you continue to enjoy them. Uh, any final words? Oh, um, no, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for, uh, for making the questions uh, so much fun to think about and, and, and for doing so much research on, um, me that's like i think in order to in order to cut beyond um small talk uh quickly one has to sort of look into what's happened like the the um do, do a decent amount of research and you clearly did that and that makes it so much more fun on my end and and it's uh an infrequent interview that i get that i enjoy this much so this has been really a pleasure thank you so much thank you for the wine uh yeah and i'm i'm excited hopefully at some point is you all dundee is that the town it is it is right, if you're yeah, in ithaca we're about 40 minutes away. Great. Yeah. At some point coming to check out the winery would be a pleasure. And our, our, we have a tasting room here up in Geneva as well, which is about an hour outside of Rochester. So, okay. And cool. Hobart and William Smith is a great college town here. And um, I'm sure there'd be a good audience for you. Awesome. So thanks again. I'm going to close this out. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. We've had a chance to talk with Ayun. Just a, a brilliant mind, a wonderful musician. He's enriching our life, and he's weaving that extra special sense of what it means to be a human, to share uh, in this culture, and to live a better life. Thanks for checking out the show. I hope you enjoyed this show. This has been Viticulture, where we share ways to cultivate a good life. Don't forget to visit our website at viticulturepodcast.com. Subscribe to our Substack where you'll get show notes, transcripts, musings, and exclusive offers. And check us out on all the major social media platforms. Thanks again for stopping by.